The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in the Epistle of Paul to the Ephesians in chapter 6, reading from verse 10 to verse 13. From verse 10 to verse 13 in the sixth chapter of Paul's Epistle to the Ephesians. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. We come back again to this most important statement here in this epistle to the Ephesians, just at the end of the epistle. Henceforth, says the apostle, this is the thing that you've got to bear in mind. And he proceeds from this 10th verse right until the 20th verse to deal with this great and most urgent matter confronting all Christian people. And, of course, he is dealing with this fight, with this conflict, which everybody coming into this world has inevitably to wage. We've uh, so far been looking at it in a general manner, introducing it, dividing up the statement into its two main component parts, and we've also seen that there are subdivisions of those. And then we looked at it uh, still in a general manner last Sunday morning from this standpoint, that the apostle is pressing this upon these Ephesians and upon us because it is clearly the only way whereby this warfare can be waged successfully. The only way. Christianity is an exclusive religion. It says that it and it alone is the truth of God. That is the claim made everywhere in the Bible from beginning to end. It's not only the only way, but it doesn't need any help or assistance. There's no need to add a little Buddhism or Mohammedanism or Confucianism or any other ism to it. It itself is the way, and it is complete. It is entire. And that is why the apostle is urging upon these people not only to consider it, but to understand it, and above all, to apply it. Now we come this morning to the apostle's explanation as to why he presses this upon them in this most urgent manner. This is his uh, characteristic, as I'm never tired of pointing out. He doesn't just make statements. He gives reasons for his statements. You see, you put on the whole armor of God for, because, we wrestle not, etc. This is one of the most glorious things about the Christian faith. You can't reason yourself into it, but the moment you are in it, you find that it's the most reasonable thing in the world full of understanding, full of explanations. Uh, Christianity, unlike so many of the cults, isn't just something which teaches you to persuade yourself in a thoughtless manner that you just say a thing and go on saying it, whatever may be true and whatever you may feel. That isn't Christianity. There are always reasons given. And the apostle here goes on to give us an explanation as to why he exhorts us to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might and to put on the whole armor of God. We need it all. Why? Well, he tells us here in uh, particularly these two verses 11 and 12. Now it's to this that I want to begin to call attention this morning. This is, of course, a most striking and a most remarkable statement. I wonder whether anybody uh, hearing this has a feeling at this moment, well, dear me, 
in the midst of the world as it is today with conditions and situations as they are are we really going to spend our time in uh, looking at and considering uh, what the devil uh, what the bible has got to say about the devil and about these principalities and powers well if you have such a feeling all i can say is this that far from being a realist as you probably imagine yourself to be you are of all people the one who really is not facing the world situation as it is this morning there is nothing more realistic at this hour than what we are about to consider together there is nothing in the whole world that is so urgently needed at this moment as an understanding of this very thing which the apostle tells us here now i shall not mention the name of any statesman i shall not mention the name of any political party i shall not mention the name of any country or any political or social organization and yet i venture to assert that what i am going to say is more relevant to the condition of the world at this hour than all talk about politics and international relationships and everything in which the statesmen and their followers indulge now i'm making a strong statement there and i'm well aware of it but if you believe the bible at all as i'm going to show you that must inevitably be true we are going to deal here with the ultimate cause of the world situation and that is why i say that this is more urgently relevant than anything else at all i was going to use this comparison let me use it again but it seems to me that uh, modern thinkers so constantly fail to do is to differentiate between a disease itself and the possible symptoms of a disease now a disease may give rise to many many symptoms take any example that you like at random with influenza prevalent and so on you may get pneumonia very well the primary disease is if you like in your lungs let that do for the moment as a rough definition but you will find you've got many other symptoms you'll have a headache you'll feel flushed you may have other aches and pains all over your body you may be sweating and so on now you see there are many many symptoms to the disease and the danger is that we should spend our time in medicating the symptoms you can take various things to relieve your headache take some aspirin and your head will be better for a while but it won't make any difference to the pneumonia and so you can go on dealing with one symptom after another and yet you'll find that you're very busy and that you have to keep on dealing with a fresh one why well because the disease itself is the thing that really matters now that's the whole trouble i suggest to you with the world at this moment here are all these statesmen and others busily meeting in conference and quarreling and so on what's the matter well the trouble is that uh, they do not realize the the nature of the disease they've never understood the cause and of course that is what makes the essence of the tragedy that the christian church which has got the message that can expose the cause and uh, recommend the only remedy that can cure the tragedy is that the christian church herself instead of doing that is half her time saying things which the statesmen and the politicians can say they do it of course because they want to give people the impression that the christian message is relevant and people you see only think that a thing is relevant if you're talking in its terms if you're talking about these statesmen by name and taking up these particular manifestations of the problem such as bombs and so are ah, you're being tremendously relevant how pathetic it is how tragic medicating the symptoms and not recognizing the disease no no the business of the christian church is to get down to the root cause of the trouble now it alone can do that nobody else can do that and it is because what we are looking at here is the only true understanding of the world situation and what can be done about it that i am claiming for it that it is the most urgently relevant message in this troubled world of ours this moment
But, of course, as I shall proceed to show, it's something that's utterly ridiculed by the world. Very well, let's have a look at it. First of all, the apostle directs us to the fact of the conflict. You notice his terms. We wrestle. Now, this term, wrestle, causes the commentators a great deal of trouble. And, of course, the trouble arises in this way, that he starts off by saying we wrestle. Then when he comes to describe the armor, uh, it's something that has nothing to do at all with wrestling. The moment you come to the details of the armor, you think rather of uh, uh, two armies meeting in conflict and uh, uh, fiery darts and things of that kind and spears. Uh, there seems to be a certain amount of confusion. Well, it's very difficult to tell what the true explanation is of why the apostle used this term we wrestle, which he only uses here. But it seems to me that the obvious explanation must be this, that he is anxious to show the intimate nature of the conflict. While it is true, as we shall see, to think of the great massed battalions, the two great opposing forces, uh, we must realize at the same time that it is an individual matter. And the notion of wrestling brings us immediately to that, Two men grappling, as it were, with one another. We wrestle. So we've got to bear the two aspects in mind. We are participators in this mighty spiritual conflict that is going on round and about us and in us. Yes, but we are also, I say, individually engaged, every one of us. We've not only got to watch as an army, we've got to watch individually. I believe that he used the term we wrestle in order to show that. But then he's got these other terms. He says, put on the whole armor of God that he may be able to stand against. Then he repeats it in verse 13. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that he may be able to withstand in the evil day. And then, having done all, to stand. Now, he uses these terms for one reason only. And that is to bring out the fierceness and the terrible nature and character of the conflict. As Christian people, we are set in this tremendous conflict, wrestling, standing against, withstanding an enemy that's attacking. You see, this is the first thing you have to do. You have to repulse the attacks. And you have to go on doing it because he's there. And then, even though you get a temporary victory, you don't say, well, it's all over. I can go to bed now and go away on a holiday. Not at all. Having done all things to stand. The idea conveyed to us is this, you see. That this is a relentless war. That there is no discharge in this war. As the book of Ecclesiastes puts it. But that as long as we are in this life and in this world, we've got to be aware of the fact that it is a fight and a struggle and a conflict. This clearly needs to be emphasized. Because there are so many people who don't realize that. And not to realize that you're in a conflict means one thing only, and that is that you're so hopelessly defeated and so knocked out, as it were, that you don't even know it. You're unconscious. It means that you're completely defeated by the devil. Anybody who is not aware of a fight and a conflict in a spiritual sense is in a drugged and in a hopeless condition. And then, of course, on the other hand, the cults are always with us. And the whole teaching of the cults, I don't care which of them you espouse, the teaching of the cults is always this, that you can be delivered right out of the conflict. Some or another. Oh, yes, this is quite true. There is the problem. But it's all right. You do this, and all will be well. That's the essence of Christian science, you see. There is no conflict. There is no such thing as disease. There is no such thing as pain. These things are non-existent, they say. And then you could keep on saying this to yourself, and you persuade yourself, and for the time being you feel very happy. But you see how it's done. It's by evading facts, by turning your back upon truth, by fooling yourself. Now, all the cults do that in some shape or form. They want to give you the impression that it's, you can relax and be at ease. 
No conflict, no fight. Whereas the apostle says, we wrestle. You're withstanding. There's an enemy who's always attacking you. And even though you get your victory, stand. Make sure that you're still standing. Always keep on your feet. In other words, the difficult thing in this world is to keep on your feet. For there is an enemy who's ever threatening you and trying to knock you down. Here is the task of life. Here is the great business of life to keep standing. Well, this is the apostle's representation of this. It isn't mine, it is his. He multiplies his terms, he repeats them, in order to bring home to us this notion that we are in the midst of a mighty conflict. Now then, let's go on and see what he's got to say about the nature of the conflict. And here, as is again not unusual with him, uh, he starts with a negative. Now as we come to this, we come to the very essence of the matter. We are now coming to what I would call the essential and peculiar character and nature of the biblical message from beginning to end. You see, there is something peculiar about the Bible. There is nothing else in the world that has this teaching. It mustn't be classed with any other book at all. Why? Well, because not only does it differ in details, its whole point of view is different. It is essentially different. It is a peculiar book, special. And this is the point, I say, at which it departs from every other teaching that is offering itself to mankind this morning. Now look at the depth of its insight. Look at its understanding. That is the thing that makes this book to me so marvelous and proves it to be the book of God himself. It gets down to the depths. It really does go down to the roots. There's nothing superficial. There's nothing glib and light. It is the profundity of the book that establishes it at once as not being a human composition. It is indeed a divine revelation. I'm making these preliminary remarks because they are, to me, the most important thing that we can grasp at this hour. That in the world as it is at this moment, here we've got a textbook, if you like, that really gives us an understanding. Nobody understands the world this morning apart from the Christian. If he really accepts this teaching. So that I'm here to say that this is a very essential part of the Christian message. And I want to go further. Our knowledge of this and our acceptance of this is a very thoroughgoing test of our profession of the Christian faith. Now then, let me ask a question before we go any further. Does this come into your essential thinking? That he may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, is this always in your thinking? Is this a part of your Christian philosophy? Is this always present in your mind? As you look at the world today, do you say at once, here's the explanation, do you normally think like that, Christian people? Well, all I say is that if we don't, we've got a very defective sort of Christianity. This is a vital and essential part of the Christian faith, the Christian message as I'm going to try to show you. Now then, what does he say? Well, the negative first. Why must I do all this? Why must I be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might? Why is it true to say that no power less than that can enable me to stand and the whole armor of God, every part and portion of it? Why? Well, negatively. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. What does he mean by that? It's important we should be clear about this. Those who are familiar with their Bibles will know that the term flesh in the New Testament, and especially in the epistles of this particular apostle, is uh, very generally used for the old nature, the sinful nature. Not the old man, but the old nature, the sinful nature. Sin residing within us, 
Now, the flesh is very commonly used in that sense, but it isn't the only sense in which it's used, and most obviously it is not the sense that is used here. There need be no discussion about that. The addition of the word blood establishes it beyond any doubt. And actually, in the Greek, the blood comes before the flesh. We wrestle not against blood and flesh. What is this, then? Well, this just means human nature. It means men. What is a man? Flesh and blood. So when he says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, what he's really saying is we are up against not men only. Our problem is not that of men or of mankind. Flesh and blood. It's something else. Now here I say is one of these basic and fundamental propositions of the scripture. And here we see how much it differs from the worldly point of view, even at its best and at its very highest. The first thing you've got to realize, says the apostle, is that the problem confronting you as an individual and the problem confronting the whole of mankind is not merely a human, earthly problem. It's much higher than that and therefore much more difficult. Now then, here I say, let us see the difference between this and what is believed on by those who are not Christian. The world, of course, doesn't believe this. It, uh, that's why the world is as it is, as I'm saying. It doesn't see this, you see. It hasn't got the negative view. What then is the cause of the trouble according to the world? Well, throughout the centuries, the world has tended to believe in... Uh, various explanations. Here are some of them. Back in these times when the church was first established, the world then generally believed in the various gods. There was a god of war, there was a god of love, there was a god of peace. They thought that, uh, and to this extent you see, they had a certain amount of insight. They thought that the world was being influenced and governed by certain unseen powers and forces. They said there are these gods. There must be. A god who shows himself in war, in all his power. But then there's clearly a god of love also. And so, you see, they felt that the one thing to do was to please and duplicate these gods. That is why you read that when the Apostle Paul visited the famous city of Athens, he found it cluttered up with temples, gods. And their idea was this, that as these gods had such influence upon men and his life in this world, obviously the thing to do was to put yourself on the right side of the god. So you had to try to cover them all, so you had a multiplicity of temples, and you took your offerings to all the gods, and you offered them your worship. Now they believed that that was the cause of the trouble. Then some of them believed in spirits, in wood and uh, trees, and in stones, in the sun, the moon, the stars, it's all a part of the same idea. Polytheism, animism, all these things are just a recognition on the part of mankind that, well, there are other forces and powers that we don't see, but which seem to be having a very great influence. Then moving a little bit from that, as men began to be more knowledgeable, they began to see that these were no gods, that these were obviously the creations of men and their minds and imaginations. This was true not only of idols which they made with their hands, but they couldn't establish the reality of these other gods. And the whole of mythology, as you know, had such exaggerations as to make the whole thing ridiculous. Then they said, well, no, perhaps it isn't that. Well, what is it then? Well, they said, you know, it's fate. It's fate. Well, what's fate? Well, nobody knows what fate is, they said. All we do know is this, that there seems to be something that is influencing us and governing us. And it's more powerful than we are. If you're fated to do such a thing, you'll do it. If you're fated that such a thing should happen to you, it will happen to you. Fatalism, this belief in some unseen power that... We can't define, but which is obviously their governing circumstances and what happens to us. Fate and fatalism. 
The world has believed in that. But uh, speaking generally, by today, I think we've moved even from that, although, of course, there are many who still believe in fate, quite obviously. And there are many who believe in astrology and things like that, in this modern, sophisticated 20th century of which we are so proud with all our education. Astrology, the influences, the stars, the month you're born, and so on. Now, you see, here is, it's interesting, and I'm calling attention to it for that reason, it's all indicative of an awareness in men that there is something outside himself which is making a tremendous difference to his life. But the modern sophisticated man, on the whole, uh, doesn't believe in all that. Well, what does he believe in? Well, his position is this, that there is nothing outside man himself, that the problem is really man himself and alone. Now, here's your typical modern, educated, moral man. He's not a Christian, of course not. Why not? Well, he doesn't believe in the spiritual world at all. That's why he doesn't believe in God. That's why he doesn't believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. That's why he doesn't believe in the Holy Spirit. That is why, of course, he doesn't believe in the devil and in the principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world. There is no such thing, he says, as a spiritual realm. This, he says, is nothing but a kind of hangover from those primitive times and days and conditions in which people did indeed believe in spirits, in trees and books and stones, and everywhere else. But we've outgrown that. He says, no, no. Man has been fooling himself throughout the centuries, and fate, and all these things, and the nonsense of astrology. Here's your modern rationalist, the man who governs everything by means of his mind, and who believes that the sole problem is man himself. In other words, it's due to man's ignorance, his lack of knowledge and of understanding, and his lack of development. I don't know what you feel, my friends. I feel this is really the most urgent problem facing the world today, speaking generally. Because, you see, if you take this view, the spiritual realm is entirely banished. But this is the position of large numbers of people. Very well, then, you say, if the problem is only that of man and man's ignorance and man's lack of knowledge, what is your solution? And they say, well, it's quite all right. It's a perfectly fair question. And they say, we've got a, an answer to give you. There are really but two things which are necessary. And this is what is being preached and taught at the present time and has been the prevailing teaching for the last 50 years or so. First, progress. Development. Evolution. Now, they say you needn't lose hope. After all, they say man is only on the threshold of the realization of his own greatness, his own glory, and his own possibilities. They say, look back, can't you see? There has already been development. There has already been advance. We've already left animism. We've turned our back upon polytheism. We've got rid of our mere fatalism. We really are now thinking. We are reasoning. Man is really beginning to come into his own. It's inevitable. There's some force in life, some elan vital, some vital force. You see, uh, that's how they put it. They, they're not fatalists, you know, and they don't believe in unseen powers, but there is in matter an elan vital, some live force and power that's pushing everything upwards and forwards. That's how they put it. They, they're not fatalists, you know, and they don't believe in unseen powers, but there is in matter an elan vital, some live force and power that's pushing everything upwards and forwards. This is the talk of the modern rationalist who only believes in things that can be reasoned about and felt and touched and measured and handled. You see, he has to fall back upon a vital force, force with a capital F. However, that is a part, as you know, of his... Explanation, it's the part of the comfort he's trying to give us. He says, don't be impatient, hold on, wait. There is this evidence of this advance and improvement, and it'll go on and on and on until eventually all problems are banished and the world becomes perfect. That's one. There are many ramifications of that. I needn't trouble you with them. Communism is one of them, of course. 
this dialectical process. Materialism, capital and labor, supply and demand, it's all a part of the process we've got to go through until we arrive at that classless, perfect state. So always remember that, that uh, the real philosophic basis of communism is uh, this whole biological view of life. There are many Christian people who seem to me to be adopting the notion of evolution more and more. Well, that's one of the results of doing that. That's it in practice and in application. Then the other answer which they give is this, that uh, in addition to this inevitable progress and forward march, what we must do, of course, is to educate one another, spread knowledge, apply our reason to the situation and get everybody else to do so. And they say quite confidently that if only you do this, then our problems are really going to be solved. Now, cannot you see, my dear friends, that this is a most vital and urgent matter? The world has really been living on this teaching during this present century. This teaching is being given much publicity at the present time, that if only you can teach people and educate them and teach them how to reason, There'll never be another war. They'll say the war is ridiculous. We must meet together. Let's have a conference. Let's settle it. I'll give this. You give that. Sign sealed, settled. All go away and we all live happily ever after. Now, they really believe that. And the result is, of course, when it doesn't happen, they're disappointed and they can't understand it and they're bewildered. But that is the prevailing notion and the prevailing theory. So we are given the comfort of the evolutionary process and the spread of knowledge and culture and education. It is to me almost beyond understanding that anybody who looks at the modern world and reads a newspaper can still go on believing that. Indeed, if they never read a newspaper, how can anybody who's, never, who's ever known an educated, cultured, reasonable man who nevertheless fails drastically in his own personal life, possibly believes such a thing? How can they believe that wisdom and knowledge and learning and the ability to reason and to use logic is the solution to the problem when they just meet men and women? It's amazing. But what I'm concerned to emphasize here particularly is this that that is the exact opposite of what the apostle here teaches. And this is the beginning of Christianity. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Man isn't the problem. The problem is not merely on the human level. There is a problem there, yes, but those are the symptoms of the disease. The real cause is further back, not against flesh and blood. Now there I justify my original statement that it is the gospel and the gospel alone that holds out any hope for this troubled, unhappy world this morning. You see, the whole basis of the conduct of affairs is on the supposition that we are wrestling only with flesh and blood. That the problem is man and that the problem can therefore be solved by human, earthly, media, and ways and means. It's man, flesh and blood. They never rise higher. The spiritual is never mentioned. Now there is, I say, something that is absolutely basic. There it's put negatively, but look at it positively. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, well, against what then? But against the devil, principalities, against powers. Notice how he repeats this word against for the sake of emphasis. Bad style, you say, what does style matter? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers. Yes, your little editors, they'd knock out these against, wouldn't they? against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. 
What is this? Well, here I say once more, you are looking straight into the face of what is most essential in the biblical and in Christian teaching. What is the problem of this world this morning? What's the ultimate cause? It is not man. It is the devil and his unseen forces and powers. That's the proposition. Now then. This is the thing which we've got to analyze and follow the apostle in his great analysis. Let us approach it therefore in general for a few moments before we close this morning by putting it like this. Here is something which is not only not believed today, but it is rejected with scorn and utterly ridiculed and regarded as the funniest of all jokes, the devil. And principalities and powers and unseen spiritual forces. The modern man says that this is an insult to a man's intelligence. There may be somebody thinking that here now. Fancy in 1960, with the world as it is, a man really proposing to preach about the devil and unseen spiritual forces. It's an insult to men's intelligence. Why don't you tell us something about how to settle the international problem? Why don't you start an agitation to stop the making of bombs? Why don't you be realistic? Why don't you be practical? Instead of there talking about something, why, they say you're in the realm of folklore. You're still manifesting the primitive mind. You ought to tell us fairy tales. Why don't you face the facts, the stark realities of life as it is today, instead of talking about some unseen spiritual forces and the devil? Ah, they say, this is behind the times. This is nonsense. Now, that's what's being said, isn't it? This is utterly and completely ridiculed. But what troubles me much more is this. That not only is it being ridiculed by the world in general, which is not Christian. It is not receiving any attention. It is not being emphasized by Christian people. And even by many evangelical people. They're all so concerned about that little sin that's getting them down, and they want life with a capital L and victory, that they never realize this great problem. They're so introspective and subjective that they never look at the whole cosmos, the world, this tremendous thing that the apostle is here putting before us. To what extent, I ask again, does this teaching concerning the devil and his powers enter into our normal, habitual thinking? The apostle says you should never relax. You should never relent. Stand always. Be ready at all times. The devil and his powers. The whole thing, I say, has been ridiculed. Now, what is our reply to that? Well, let me just suggest some ideas like this to you. This whole matter of believing in the devil and in these spiritual powers is, after all, you know, just the problem of a belief at all in a spiritual realm. That's the fundamental question. Do you believe in a spiritual realm at all? There are many who call themselves Christian who obviously don't. They have reduced Christianity to a moral ethical teaching. It's nothing else. There's no spiritual realm there. No realm which is above us, which influences us. They don't believe in that at all. They may say in practice in words that they do, but in their actual lives they don't. They're not aware of the spiritual realm at all. Of course, if a man doesn't believe in God, he's quite consistent. If he doesn't believe in God, I wouldn't expect him to believe in the devil. But what I cannot understand is a man who does believe in God and who doesn't believe in the devil. What I cannot understand is a man who says, gets up in his church and says, I believe in the Holy Ghost, and then regards the devil as a joke. I believe in the Holy Spirit, but he doesn't believe in the evil spirit. That's the man I don't understand. He is utterly inconsistent. He says he believes in a spiritual realm. Yes, but only half of it. He doesn't believe in the other half. Oh, yes, what is involved here is our whole attitude towards a spiritual realm that is above us and outside us. Oh, let me put it like this. For you to see what exactly you do if you don't believe in the devil and these spiritual powers, or if you're not certain about this. The problem really, you know, is not a belief in the devil. It's a belief in the authority of the scripture. That's what it comes to. 
Those other people, they don't believe the Bible is the word of God. They reject the virgin birth, they reject the miracles, they reject the atonement, they reject the personality of the Holy Spirit. So I'm not a bit surprised that they reject the devil and the forces of the devil. Why? Well, because, you see, their attitude is this. Here they are, they're educated, they're cultured, they're learned, they're 1960 men, and they come to this old book. Of course, they say, it's such an old book, you know. And it's a book like every other book, and a lot of rubbish in it, a lot of error in it. People put in what was believed at the time, because we know now that that's not true. So, you see, they come as the authorities. The book is not the authority. They're the authority. Out goes this, out goes that. Out goes Holy Spirit, out goes devil. All these things, what's left? Oh, well, simply what I can understand and what I believe to be true. I am the authority, my reason. That's what you're up against. It isn't a mere matter of believing in the devil, you know. It's your whole attitude towards the scripture. Why do I say that? Well, for this reason, that this teaching about the devil and his forces is an essential, vital part of the biblical teaching. It is found everywhere from Genesis to Revelation, and especially in Genesis and in Revelation. But it's everywhere else. Our Lord himself taught it. And if you believe in him and in his teaching, you've got to believe in what he said about the devil and his powers. So you see, we are fundamentally face to face with this belief in the Bible as our only revelation and authority, or a trusting to ourselves and our own understanding, miserable worms that we are, making such a mess of our world with our great minds and understanding that can go into the spiritual and say what's there and what isn't there, how ridiculous it all is. But wait a moment. A belief in the devil and his powers is an absolute necessity to a belief in the biblical teaching concerning sin and evil. You can't really believe the biblical doctrine concerning sin unless you believe in the devil and his forces. Fifthly, I go on to say this, that a belief in the devil and his forces is absolutely essential to a true understanding of the biblical doctrine of salvation. Ah, oh, but you say it can't be. I believe Christ died for my sins upon the cross. Well, all right, my friend, that's quite right. But tell me, why did he have to come? What was he really doing on the cross? According to the Apostle Paul, he was there putting principalities and powers to an open shame, triumphing over them in it. Why did Christ have to come? Well, he, one of his answers was this. He said, the strong man armed keepeth his goods at peace. But when a stronger than he cometh, he despoileth him of his armor in which he trusted. Don't think that you can understand the biblical doctrine of salvation and reject the devil. You cannot. You haven't got the true doctrine of salvation if you don't believe in the devil and his powers. You've got a little psychological treatment for yourself which makes you feel happy because you think your sins are forgiven. But you haven't understood the essence of why Christ came and what he had to do and the fight and the conflict. And the agony in the garden and the temptations and all the rest of it. That's no meaning to you. It can't have. So you haven't got a full gospel, if you've got a gospel at all. And sixthly and lastly, I assert once more that you simply cannot understand the history in the Bible the whole history of the world from the dawn of civilization until this morning. You cannot understand modern history and what's happening in the world today, the confusion, the amazement that the world is as it is in spite of all the advance that we've heard so much about. You cannot understand that. Still less can you understand the future or have any hope with respect to it unless you've got a clear understanding of what the apostle teaches us here about the devil and the principalities and powers against the world rulers of this darkness, against wicked spirits in the heavens. You say this is depressing. Depressing? I find this the most comforting, cheering, optimistic thing that I know of. What is to me depressing is to be confronted by a situation that I don't understand. If I don't understand the situation, I feel lost. I was never satisfied with medicating symptoms. Oh, I knew the patient felt a bit better. But you see, the question is, what's the matter with the man? And I was ill at ease until I knew. 
It's a great thing to know the trouble, to make a diagnosis. And the moment you've got a diagnosis, you should feel better and happier. You say, well, now then, we know what we're dealing with. I say this is glorious optimism. But thank God this message doesn't stop merely at the delineation of the character of the problem. It does do that in this realistic manner. It then leads us on to the source of victory and of power. It gives us a view of history which sends me home confident and assured. Though I am standing against the devil and the principalities and powers and wrestling against these infernal hordes, I can be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I can be clothed with the whole armor of God. I can withstand. And having done all things, still stand and stand with confidence, knowing that in him and in the power of his might I am safe, and that his final ultimate victory is always assured. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.